We're good. Let's do it. Thank you. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here to celebrate and to engage in this conversation with Harsha and Robin. Um, I'm Maya Marshall. I'm an editor for Haymarket Books. I work on the poetry. And um, I'm just going to be the chair for today to, to keep time and to, to get into the conversation at about um, 11 o'clock. Uh, just a heads up, this session is going to be live streamed as part of our virtual program for Socialism 2022. <coughs> so if you want to be in this part participate in the discussion but do not want to be on video, please just let our live stream staff know. You can tell me, you can tell Sean all the way in the back. Um, and we can make sure that we take care of that. Um, I want to remind you of our COVID protocols, which mm, are in place to keep our comrades safe. Um, so please keep your mask on at all times <coughs> in every session, um, fully covering your nose and your mouth while indoors in the conference spaces and including hallways and meeting rooms. The speakers at the front of the room during the sessions might remove their masks just to deliver their presentation, but then they'll put them right back on. And up on the floor when we're having discussion, please do keep your masks on. Um, all of this is going to be recorded. This is the format. So we'll do about 30 to 35 minutes from the present presenters uh, and then start like a 40 minute discussion with the audience. And then we'll have a wrap up from these brilliant humans who are shining stars at Haymarket. Um, our first presenter will be Harsha Walia, author of Order and Rule. <laughs> Available in the bookstore upstairs. Make sure you rush and get one. Um, Harsha is an active is, is active in migrant justice, anti-capitalist feminist, abolitionist, and anti-imperialist movements, and is the award-winning author of Undoing Border Imperialism. Um, she will be here in conversation with Robin D.G. Kelly. <laughs> Professor of uh, the Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair of US History at UCLA. His books include Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, and Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination, reprinted here with a brand new introduction from Aja Monet for the 20th anniversary edition. We will also be doing two more talks today because he's the hardest working man in socialism. <laughs> the Dig Live at three, and Freedom Dreams and Socialist Project at seven. All right, so let's welcome up Parsha. Thank you. How is everyone? Good morning. Good morning. Saturday morning. How are you all feeling? Good. I'm so much more comfortable at a rally, so I feel like I want to chant. And also what happened is on my way crossing into the US, which often happens when I'm crossing borders, is I get stuck in secondary and tertiary interrogation. And one of the things that they asked me amongst other things was whether I was going to a protest, and I had to very forlornly say no. <laughs> and so I'm hoping we can do a chant to wake us up and also so I can be petty to DHS and say that I actually was at a protest. So when I say no one is illegal, can you say on stolen native land? All right, no one is illegal. Plan. No one is illegal. Plan. No one is illegal. Plan. Thank you. So we wake up. So, such an honor to be here at the conference. Thank you to the organizers. Can we give a round of applause to all of the organizers for this incredible conference? for this convening, for bringing us together, and also my deepest debt of gratitude to Robin Kelly for being in conversation. Can you raise your hand if Robin Kelly is one of your touch points in organizing and political work? Yeah, thank you, Robin. <laughs> so, um, I'm doing a, a book talk, which is really uh, a strange thing for me, because again, I, I, I'm rooted deeply in organizing, so the first thing I wanna say about 
writing this book is that it's really a project of collective knowledge and movement-based knowledge that's generated through collective struggle. There is no liberation and isolation, and that is also true of movement scholarship. Um, so the, the starting point of my talk is that borders must be abolished. That's not the ending point of my talk. I'm gonna start there. And when my book came out, my young daughter was very unimpressed. She looked at it, she's like, there's no pictures in here. And that's a lot of words to say borders are bad. So let me just start by saying borders are bad. Um, so this isn't only about ICE or DHS or private detention centers or even all detention centers. The entire structure of border control is foundationally constructed to maintain social violence and control. Even more, borders are a modality central not only to social control, but to eugenicist population ordering. For example, through racial exclusion, vagrancy laws deporting the poor or those deemed criminal, laws excluding single women migrants deemed to be sex workers, attacks on labor unionism through the expulsion of communists and anarchists dating back to the Palmer raids, sodomy laws and bars on queer and trans migrants, a medical examination as a basis for excluding disabled migrants. The mass production and social organization of difference is at the heart of border craft, both making the so-called good versus bad migrant, as well as maintaining the colonial, racial, gendered, sexualized, ableist, and classist orderings amongst all of us. With a resurgent white nationalist, anti-trans, xenophobic fascism, the border is more than ever a central site of struggle. Far-right appeals target so-called foreigners for stealing our jobs, draining our services, ruining our environment, infecting our neighborhoods, and tainting our values. This deflects responsibility from the underlying socioeconomic systems producing mass inequality, impoverishment, and misery by conveniently scapegoating migrants and buttressing moral panics about the border. Our responses to such far-right drivel cannot be liberal moralizing about how good immigrants are or how much immigrants contribute. It must be a rigorous analysis of the border itself. And more than anything, we must remember that our enemy today arrives in a limousine and not on a boat. This is especially true with the climate crisis being linked to the migration crisis. In France, Marine Le Pen, a far-right politician, is making a frightening comeback in some progressive circles with her new screed of, quote, borders are the environment's greatest ally. It is through them that we will save the planet, end quote. Borders are at the heart of an un -ver us versus them politics of domination. Borders must be abolished. The southern U.S.-Mexico border is illustrative in terms of thinking about border formation and border function. Border controls are often seen as a migrant justice issue, separate from anti-imperialist struggle, black liberation, or indigenous decolonization struggles. Nothing could be further from the truth. Here I would point to the work of Audra Simpson, Shannon Speed, Robin Maynard, Kelly Hernandez, Baji, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Red Nation, and many others. U.S. bordering practices were in fact conceived of as a method of imperialist conquest, eliminating indigenous peoples, and controlling black people. The U.S.-Mexico border was formed as a direct result of conquest and the forced annexation of over 525,000 square miles of territory illegally annexed after the imposition of the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Around the same time, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act was passed, allowing slaveholders to kidnap and capture black people they claimed had escaped. After the 1848 annexation, slave owners formed militias to patrol the U.S.-Mexico border to prevent black people from escaping to Mexico. Some of the earliest bordering practices at the U.S.-Mexico border were not only to keep migrants out, specifically Chinese migrants at the time, but were also to keep enslaved black people in. For indigenous people, immigration and citizenship laws were weapons to further the genocidal elimination of indigenous political and social formations. The Dawes Act and the Indian Citizenship Act basically imposed U.S. citizenship on indigenous people. And a condition of this colonial assimilation was what indigenous peoples had to agree to and had to agree to live on individual plots of land that were carved from the U.S. government's confiscation and partitioning of their lands for the settler colonial capitalist project. Crees, Chippewas, and Yankees had to launch political battles for tribal recognition after being considered illegal immigrants in the United States. The very category of immigrant and illegal have been essential in forming the settler colonial slaveholding nation state. 
These synergies are clear even today in the deployment of the border enforcement goons not only at the border, but also to train occupation forces in Iraq, in Guatemala, to repress black uprisings in Portland, and indigenous resistance in Standing Rock. And today, of course, indigenous and black peoples from Central America, Mexico, Haiti, the Sahel and Horn regions disproportionately bear the violence of global displacement and border violence. Borders are everywhere. Borders must be abolished. <laughs> Border enforcement must be understood as bipartisan practice and not simply about Trump. This is particularly important in the Biden era. It was actually under Clinton and Obama that an entire immigration enforcement apparatus bent on expanding detention and deportation, criminalizing migration through prosecution, and militarizing the border was cemented. The Clinton years normalized the most severe consequences of border militarization and mass detention by merging three things, the war on drugs, the war on gangs, and the war on migrants. Under Clinton, Border Patrol tripled in size to become the second largest enforcement agency at the time. Operations such as Hold the Line in Texas, Gatekeeper in California, and Safeguard in Arizona militarized the border under the official strategy of, quote, prevention through deterrence. Remember, the doctrine of deterrence requires and relies on and results in mass border death. Within six years of funneling migration towards the more dangerous Sonoran Desert, Arizona uplands, and southern Texas brush, border deaths, what we should more accurately label as premeditated border killings, increased by 509%. Obama also spent billions of dollars securing the border. Border and immigration enforcement budgets began to outpace the budgets of all other federal law enforcement agencies combined. Obama turbocharged secure communities until 2014, under which over 1,000 lo local law enforcement jurisdictions were linked to ICE and FBI databases, doubling deportation rates. By 2014, half of all federal criminal arrests were immigration related. Under Obama, unmanned aerial vehicles were first tested on the U.S.-Mexico border before they were used in drone attacks on Yemen and Pakistan. He who dropped an average of three bombs every hour also earned the moniker of deporter-in-chief for overseeing three million deportations. And it was Obama who, with, who in signing the much lauded DREAM Act, said, quote, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide for her kids, end quote. This rhetoric of productive and legal immigrants with the simultaneous demonization of criminal and illegal immigrants has been the cornerstone of the Democratic Party. So-called criminality and illegality are both political constructions invented and policed as race-making and property-protecting regimes. As Ruthie Gilmore reminds us, proving one's innocence or respectability within these constructs is a frustrating and inherently impossible political stance. Which is why migrant justice movements aligned with abolitionist struggles must refuse the liberal lure to, endure, to endorse categories of desirable or undesirable migrants, must reject assimilation and labor commodification as the price of neoliberal citizenship, and must challenge state borders as leg legitimate institutions of governance. Human beings are not illegal. Borders are bad. <clears throat> the second point that I'd like to make is, is the migration crisis even real? We hear about the migration crisis, the refugee crisis, the border crisis all the time. And I, alongside others, want to reframe the term migration crisis. The global migration crisis is more accurately described as a crisis of displacement and immobility. First, on the crisis of displacement. The total number of migrants worldwide has reached 272 million people, 3.5% of the world's population, of which 89.3 million are forcibly displaced. An emphasis on displacement rather than migration forces us to interrogate the root causes of conquest, capitalism, and climate change that are the real culprits and drivers of displacement. Palestinians, for example, are considered the world's, quote, most protracted refugee problem, according to the UN, with close to six million Palestinians in refugee camps. The so-called Palestinian problem, or refugee crisis, is inextricable from the ongoing illegal Zionist occupation of Palestine since 1948 and the struggle to free Palestine and for the right of Palestinians to return. In the US, Hondurans, El Salvadorans, and Guatemalans make up the fastest growing proportion of people crossing in. These perilous migrations are portrayed by liberal media as an over there problem. 
However, these migrations are inextricable from displacements created by US dirty wars backing death squads across Central America and the counterinsurgency terror of the war on drugs. From the war against FMLN in El Salvador to the coup to oust Honduran President Zelaya, there is an unbroken line of US interventions, as we know. Migration is a predictable consequence of these displacements. Today, displacements are escalating with climate disasters, an estimated one person every two seconds, every two seconds is being displaced due to climate catastrophe. In Pakistan today, over 33 million people are being impacted and displaced due to torrential rains and flash floods. Climate change is the single fastest growing form of global displacement, though of course completely intertwined with the violence of military occupation, land theft and dispossession, resource extraction, capitalist trade agreements, labor exploitation, and so on. In the midst of the climate crisis, displaced refugees, least responsible for and with the fewest resources to adapt to climate variations, face militarized borders in our warming world. A quote from a Pentagon report. Borders will be strengthened around the country to hold back unwanted, starving immigrants from the Caribbean, and especially severe problem, Mexico and South America, end quote. All of this is precisely why so many movements say, we are here because you are there. In the face of liberalism that frames conversations around mass displacement as one of immigration quotas and legality and illegality, we have to articulate migration as both an act of individual self-determination and as an expression of decolonial reparations and redistribution long overdue. We simply cannot talk about immigration as a domesticated policy issue without accounting for global asymmetries of power, of capitalism, white supremacy, class, gender, caste, ableism, imperialism, and so on. Les Gillettes Noir, a collective of mostly African undocumented migrants in France, assert their presence as an accounting for the exploitation that is a precondition for Europe. They boldly pronounce, quote, we are the freedom to move, to settle down, to act. We will take it as our right, end quote. Language such as migrant crisis is a pretext to shore up further border securitization and repressive practices of detention and deportation. When the state and mainstream media invoke a border crisis, it is not to end imperial drone warfare across borders or fossil fuel extraction across borders. No, the border is only represented as a victim when it is being violated and trespassed by migrants. Constant images and languages of swarm, flood, caravan, invaders, all depict and villainize migrants and refugees as the cause of a border crisis, when in fact a crisis is not of the border, but due to the border. Despite constant border panics, 95% of forcibly displaced people remain internally displaced or in refugee camps in neighboring countries. We see the reconfiguration of the state when it claims a crisis, for example, in the language of border deaths which launders violent state responses. There have been at least 50,000 recorded deaths of migrants around the world since 2014. Migrants are routinely blamed for their own deaths. Why did they cross the desert in the heat? Why did they turn to smugglers? Why did they put their children on a dinghy boat without a life jacket? These are victim blaming responses that intentionally turn the gaze away from state violence much like victim blaming responses in rape culture. These aren't border deaths due to the migration crisis. These are border killings that the border deliberately produces. Moving to the crisis of immobility. When we say migration crisis, we tend to assume that most people are actually able to move in search of safety. Researchers note that less than 1% of refugees find a permanent home. People are not able to move because border controls are deadly. People are being contained at border sites and refugee camps through interdiction, pushbacks, restricted visa requirements, smart borders, etc. Reframing the migration crisis as a displacement and immobility crisis illuminates that most migrants are forcibly displaced and systematically immobilized. Displacement and immobility then, not free movement, is the reality of racial imperial management in our contemporary era. In this sense, borders are carceral regimes. Police, prisons, and borders all operate by immobilizing people. Notably, the word mob, a criminalizing vocabulary used to link large groups of poor racialized people to social disorder in inner cities and at the border, derives from the word mobility. There is no crisis of migration. There is a relentless crisis of displacement and immobility within and across nation-state borders. 
Mapping who is most vulnerable to dispossession and displacement reveals the fault lines between rich and poor, between whiteness and its black, indigenous, and racialized others. The border, the prison, the sweatshop floor, the refugee camp, the reservation, the gentrified gated community are all part of the same system operating through dispossession, capture, containment, and immobility, all intended to enforce harmful power relations and destroy communal social organization. These bordering regimes, or we could say ordering regimes, simultaneously manufacture and discipline surplus populations under capitalism and colonialism, while parasitically extracting land, labor, and life itself. Angela Davis and Gina Dent write, quote, we continue to find that the prison is itself a border, end quote. The prison is a border and the border is a prison. Most ironically and offensively, the migration crisis is declared a new crisis with Western countries positioned as its primary victims. Even though for four centuries, nearly 80 million Europeans became settler colonists across the Americas and Oceania, while four million indentured laborers from Asia were scattered across the globe, and the transatlantic slave trade kidnapped and enslaved 50 million Africans. Colonialism, genocide, slavery, and indentureship are not only completely erased as continuities of violence and current invocations of a migration crisis, but they are the very conditions of possibility for notions of the border. This is more semantics, but important nonetheless, is questioning who is even considered a migrant within the narrative of the migration crisis. Classifications such as migrant or refugee do not represent unified social groups as much as they symbolize state-regulated relations of difference and state-manufactured conditions of vulnerability. Even though there are millions of people who are on the move today, more than ever before, by which I mean people who are not immobilized, investors, bankers, expats, hipster tourists, vacationers, literally Columbusing and airbnb all around the world. That kind of movement is not surveillance or scapegoated. In fact, under our system, that kind of movement is celebrated. Urban renewal, for example, often basically advertises itself as the new colonial pioneering. I'm not displacing anyone. There was nothing here before, right? Gentrification, usurping land and property that is viciously enforced through policing and displacement of homeless encampments is after all a bordering regime. So when we say migration crisis, we aren't actually talking about all kinds of movements or anyone on the move. While the rich from wealthy states routinely enjoy borderless mobility around the world, and while countries continue to freely bomb, pollute, and mine across borders, the world's majority of racialized poor people are subjected to criminalization, illegalization, immobility, and premature death. In fact, embedded in the language and the language of migration crisis is the anti-black idea of a certain kind of inherently undesirable movement, unregulated and ungovernable. The sustained capture and punishment of black mobility, the racialization of, mu of Muslims dating back to the Reconquista, the genocidal corralling of indigenous people onto reservations, the violent transformation of non-capitalist land stewardship into the regime of private property, the dispossession of millions into caste oppressed indentured labor, and the deliberate cleaving and creation of the so-called post-colonial nation state are all bordering regimes that are constitutive of the global policing of migration today. Which is precisely what we know of as the kind of domesticated politics of immigration and borders must actually be placed within globalized asymmetries of power that are creating mass displacement and constricting mobility. Next, the border exists everywhere. Contrary to how we think about borders, borders are not fixed lines demarcating territory. Put another way, the border is elastic and the magical line can exist anywhere. It can exist far within and far beyond the border. Which is why I continue to emphasize bordering regimes as a method of governance rather than the border and the spectacle of the border itself. Border outsourcing is a key method of imperialism in our contemporary era but current analyses of imperialism, including those who claim that we no longer live in a world marked by imperialism, as well as analysis of border enforcement confined to what is happening only at the state border, have largely ignored this crucial reality. We need to be paying more attention to how this outsourcing of border controls is increasingly a method of, of maintaining imperial superpower in the world, especially for US, Canada, Israel, India, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and Western and Central EU countries. Imperialism is, of course, already a root cause of global migration. 
And now the management of global migration through outsourcing is becoming a means of preserving imperialism. For example, while Biden can, can claim he won't build Trump's border wall, he is effectively creating a fortress far beyond the site of the border itself to stop migrants and refugees before they even reach the border. US, Australian, and European subordination of Central America, Oceania, Africa, and the Middle East compels countries in these regions to accept border checkpoints, drone surveillance, offshore detention, and migration prevention and interception campaigns as conditions of trade and aid agreements. We have to understand how critical immigration-related diplomacy is to current global relations, sometimes outright threats of trade war even, which has compelled countries across Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East and Oceania to accept outsourced migration controls. Nairu, formerly under Australian administrative and trusteeship until 1968, and devastated through centuries of resource colonialism, has now become Australia's dumping ground for refugees. When Australia started offshoring refugee de detention to Nairu 20 years ago, it increased aid to Nairu amounting to one-third of the country's GDP. Nairu, Libya, Mali, Mexico, Niger, Papua New Guinea, Rwanda, currently in the news due to the deal with the UK, Turkey and Sudan are all becoming the new frontiers of border militarization. Similarly, Croatia, Ukraine, and Moldova, who recently joined or aspire to join the EU, must participate in EU border management missions and partnerships. The outsourcing of border controls is becoming a means of managing global migration by globalizing the violence of borders and maintaining a colonial presence. <clears throat> today, in the United States, initiate the, today in the United States, the outsourcing of border violence is becoming a critical means of preserving imperial relations in Mexico and Central America. Initiated by Bush and expanded under Obama and Biden, the multi-billion dollar U.S.-Mexico or Merida initiative provides funding for a battery of police and migration checkpoints beginning in southern Chiapas and ending at the border. The U.S. also funds immigration enforcement in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico to stop people well before they reach the border. The Central American Regional Security Initiative militarizes the entire landscape through the triad of the war on drugs, the war on indigenous lands, and the war on migrants. Shortly after the U.S. launched the Mexico-Guatemala-Belize border region program, Homeland Security officials declared that, quote, the Guatemalan border with Chiapas is now our southern border. Similarly, Europe forces many African countries in the Sahel region to accept the outsourcing of EU border controls. The Khartoum process, Valletta Summit, Migration Partnership Framework, African Peace Facility Program, EU Emergency Trust for Africa, it goes on and on all promise EU funds in exchange for, quote, reducing African migration into Europe. Most EU trade agreements today force other countries to implement border checkpoints, migration prevention campaigns, anti-smuggling, anti-trafficking, and interdiction operations. The EU directly funds anti-migrant surveillance, military equipment, detention centers, border enforcement trainings, and troops in Tunisia, Niger, Libya, Mali, Mauritania, Rwanda, Sudan, and more. Echoing the DHS official I quoted earlier, an Italian interior minister put it as, quote, securing Libya's southern border means securing European, Europe's southern border, end quote. The massive scale of ongoing imperialist land grabbing, often under the guise of green conservation, and military expansion on the African continent, US Africa Command is now the most active US military command based on number of combat operations, all exist alongside the enforced expansion of border enforcement within Africa to serve fortress Europe. The border is everywhere. Next, <clears throat> borders are a key pillar of racial capitalism. Border enforcement is not only about the terror of outright exclusion and expulsion. Borders are not intended to exclude or deport all people, but to create conditions of deportability, which produces immense precarity. Workers' labor power is captured by the border and this pliable labor is exploited by the employer. After its inception in 1924, US Border Patrol was overseen by the Department of, anybody know? Labor, the Department of Labor for decades. We know, thank you to Robin Kelly amongst others, that the racial expropriation of land, labor, and life is innate to capitalism. Capitalism relies on and requires racial hierarchies and the border is central to this process. Capitalism requires labor to be constantly segmented and the border acts as a spatial fix for capitalism by bifurcating the global labor force. 
Border controls manufacture spatialized difference not only to completely exclude all people, but to capitalize on them. In 2019, we may recall 680 workers at processing plants in Mississippi were raided in an ICE raid shortly after a high-profile unionization drive. According to one study, 52% of companies in the U.S. threatened to call immigration authorities on workers during union drives. Neoliberal U.S. commentator Thomas Friedman says candidly, quote, we have a real immigration crisis, and the solution is a high wall with a big gate, a smart gate, end quote. While far-right movements are immigration exclusionists driven by xenophobic and restrictionist ideology, the reality is that immigration backlash or anti-immigration backlash is not intended to exclude all migrants, but rather to make the condition of migration, including the condition of migrant labor, more precarious. While workers are declared illegal, the surplus value they create is never deemed illegal. The lack of full immigration status and the tying of visa status to an employer are key to creating pools of cheapened indentured labor. These legal but often deportable workers are often spatially and socially segregated in the case of legal migrant workers, housed in separate labor camps, unprotected by national labor laws or unionization, unable to fully access public services, and unable to bring their families with them. Labor migration shapes and sustains the state and capital's ability to coerce labor and manage citizenship. The designation of foreign workers creates a material and ideological differentiation that further affixes race to citizenship. Foreign workers is essentially a euphemism for third world workers. Jobs such as farm work and domestic work that cannot be outsourced to the periphery are being insourced through migrant work. Even where workers are working in the same national labor market or for the same corporate employer transnationally, the border enforces wage differentiation based on race, citizenship, gender, and more. Insourced labor from labor migration programs and outsourced labor in free trade zones, think NAFTA, thus represent two sides of the same coin, deliberately deflated labor and political power. It is crucial to understand that the border actually works in the interest of capital and not against it. This is why those on the left who believe that more border enforcement is better for citizen workers are misdirected and completely fucking wrong. <laughs> In their formulation, migrant workers are essentially scab workers who are lowering the wage floor and stealing from citizens. Migrant workers do not suppress wages. Bosses and borders do. Free capital requires immobilized labor, which the border produces. This is why it is important for left movements to take up the call for status for all workers as put forward by migrant, migrant worker organizations all around the world, particularly led by domestic worker and farm worker organizations. This means that all migrant workers should have immigration status, the right to collectively organize and unionize, full rights to labor protections, and full health and safety protections. The only way to fight back against the cheapening of labor is to engage in an internationalist struggle against racist citizenship and racial capitalism. <laughs> Employers and elite rulers intend the making of illegal and migrant workers to be an effective firewall or border against solidarity between workers. So we need to fight for immigration status, for labor protection, and living wages for all workers and to make the divisions created by the border obsolete. We must refuse the ruling class attempts to pit migrants against workers because not only is that racist, but for migrants to be successfully pitted against workers presupposes that migrants are not also workers participating in and leading, and leading class struggles. In conclusion, what is a no-borders world? To be a modern liberal nation state in a state-centric world presupposes the existence of a secured border. The liberal modern nation state has aborted the dream of genuine decolonization and liberation by providing a territorial and jurisdictional grounding for capital and becoming the most legible form of coercive state power. The Indian Border Security Force is the world's largest border security force. Europe's Mediterranean border is the world's deadliest border. Australia jails detainees for an average of 689 days in its matrix of offshore detention centers. 
In Toni Morrison's home, she described, quote, the contemporary world's work has become policing, halting, forming policy regarding and trying to administer the movement of people, end quote. We are witness to the horrific impacts of this categorization and control of people every day. Every day we are witness to suffocation in cargo trucks, dehydration and blistering heat, unmarked graves in deserts, lethal pushbacks of migrant caravans and wet cemeteries. This is the daily deathscape of those killed by borders. Given the violent deathscape for literally millions of people around the world, what other alternative is there other than to fight for a world without borders? What even is the function of borders today? Borders maintain asymmetric relations of wealth accrued from colonial impoverishment, from capitalism, and a system of mobility for some and mass immobility and containment for most. Essentially, a divided working class and a system of global apartheid determining who can live where and under what conditions. Border policies cannot be tweaked or reformed. They must be dismantled if we believe in justice at a planetary scale. Real advocates of internationalism cannot accept the lingering reality of the global south, which continues to exist in large part because of the continued differentiation of borders. A world without borders is not the same as a world with open borders. In an open borders world, the world stays configured the way that it is with massive inequality, mass displacement, continued hierarchies, except borders are opened up. If people are still being forced from their lands in some parts of the world, including within the global north, of course, are still being plundered and treated as sacrifice zones for centers of power, there is no justice in an open borders world. A no borders politics is more expansive than the site of the border itself. Thinking alongside organizations like Le Gillette Noir, Mikente, No One Is Illegal, the Sans Papier Movement, Red Nation, and Baji, I would argue that a no borders politics is actually about dismantling all bordering, all ordering, and all exploitative regimes. Like the regime of private property, borders are not simply lines marking territory. They are shaped by and shape social relations. The border produces a colonial racial social order, fortifies the rich against the rest, deflates labor power, treats sacred land as a possession, and is the ideological basis for all repressive immigration policies. Borders must be abolished. We live in a world, we need a world without borders. Put another way, to live in a world that doesn't have borders is not only to struggle for the rights of refugees and migrants, but to fight for freedom for all against displacement and immobility. It is to fight for liberation so that everyone has a home where we can all live freely in our neighborhoods, in our lands, our homes, in relationship and kinship with one another. The battle against borders is necessarily inclusive of movements against gentrification, of liberation struggles against colonialism and occupation, of the fight to be free from policing and cages and bosses and banks, of dreams articulated by queer and trans and feminist and disability justice movements of being at home in our bodies, and to ensure we have a habitable earth for all living creatures. We have to dismantle all the systems that uphold the system of apartheid that even allows the global north to exist in relation to the south, or of course the conditions of the south within the north. A no borders world includes the freedom to stay, the freedom to move, meaning no one should be forcibly displaced, and people should be free to move with safety and dignity. These may seem contradictory, but they are corollaries. The freedom to stay and the freedom to move, which is to say no borders, is reparations and redistribution long overdue. We want an end to all detentions and deportations, full immigration status for all, demilitarization, abolition of police and prisons, dismantling of capitalism, and collective liberation. No Borders is also a clarion call for the established left, specifically the environmental movement and major labor unions. State formation, class relations, extractivism, and social hierarchies are generated through one another. The conditioning of environmental movements and class struggles through citizenship reinforces the logic of scarcity upon which austerity and carceral governance depends, maintains the international division of labor and a lowered wage floor upon which capitalism relies, and aligns with far-right racism and ruling class extractivist ideology. More specifically, environmental movements advocating for conservation, biocarbon sequestration, biofuel production, and alternative energies are often complicit in greenwashed colonialism locally and globally. Even more progressive proposals like a Green New Deal have become trapped in imperialist imaginaries of rich countries as a white sanctuary and gated community. 
Rich countries must redress the global and asymmetrical dimensions of climate debt, unfair trade and financial agreements, military subjugation, vaccine apartheid, labor exploitation, and border securitization. In a similar vein, unions that call for border enforcement against migrant workers, as I said earlier, in the interests in interest of so-called citizen workers, misrecognize the role of the border and capital. The border cannot protect the working class against neoliberal globalization because immobilized labor generated by the border serves the interests of free capital. <clears throat> An internationalist feminist abolitionist labor rights platform is perhaps best articulated by migrant sex workers enduring the intersection of sex work criminalization, precarious migration status, and gendered labor. We achieve all of this by believing in the necessity of a world without borders and by committing to struggle. Revolutions stretch our imagination. Political struggle is a purpose and a practice because even amidst omnipresence violence, we have to remember that the future is a process we generate through our collective commitment to struggle. Empires crumble, capitalism is not inevitable, gender is not biology, whiteness is not immutable, Prisons are not inescapable, and borders are not natural law. While a world without borders certainly requires us to stretch our futurist imaginations, no borders is a present day practical politics today. Movements calling for the abolition of border enforcement, the dismantling of border controls wherever they proliferate, proliferate an end to all deportations and the criminalization of migration, immigration status for all, labor to protection and universal public services for all are offering a vision for a different world today. In Australia, RISE demands housing, healthcare, language services, education, work rights, legal aid, and freedom of movement for all. Hundreds of campaigns around the world fighting for solidarity, sanctuary cities, where undocumented residents are guaranteed access to public needs, and where local jurisdictions limit cooperation with federal immigration agents are happening today. Dozens of civilian solidarity rescue missions on land and on sea are engaged in life-saving and often criminalized efforts to provide water, food, shelter, and transport. People are opening their homes to refugees. Congregations of faith are sheltering migrant fugitives. Food and medical distribution at border sites like Calais and Nogales. Migrant workers and labor unions uniting to establish rank-and-file worker centers and direct actions preventing immigration raids all make and extend networks of collective care and safety beyond and against neoliberal nationalist conceits. On indigenous Wet'suwet'en land, elders and matriarchs exercise alternative conceptions of governance rooted in their laws. Everyone entering their lands is asked, what is your intention? How will your visit benefit the community? Are you here on behalf of industry or the government? These questions are fundamentally about consent and an explicit counterforce to the very logics of carceral, colonial, and capitalist borders. It reminds us that our responsibilities to one another and all living beings are actively negotiated and can and must be deproprietary, decarceral, demilitarized, and decolonial. Thus, a liberatory no borders politics in the now is a grammar that destabilizes the machinery of the colonial capitalist state itself. And the everyday unsanctioned movement of people defying borders and risking death is in itself world-making and home-making. Without romanticizing the political form of all of these movements, we cannot discount the sheer will and productive power to fight for a different life, propelling migrants and refugees to subvert a multi-billion dollar industry of barbed wire walls, drone surveillance, militarized checkpoints, and bureaucratic violence aimed at fatally deterring them. Revolutions bring no guarantees, but they do call on us to dream, to listen, to commune, to act, to struggle, to dismantle, to rematriate, to create, to move. Movements call on us to move. Thinking of world making as home making is not a sentimental matter. At the edge of climate catastrophe, it is a pressing political issue. And I want to close with the words of Eduardo Galeano when he said, quote, the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. No borders is a politics of home for all of us. Thank you.
Thank you. That was brilliant. Um, all right, y'all. So it's time to hear from Robin and yeah. the conversation, and then we'll shift to the open discussion and the progressive set. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. No, I decided not to go to the podium. Um, the podium's too hot right now. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to burn myself. Um, and I, I just have to say, just because I've, I've read this book many times, this is just a teaser. I just want you to know that. So you need to, if you don't have the book, uh, you know where to get it. You know, there's plenty of copies and, and have Harsha sign it. Um, it's always great to be in conversation uh, with you and to talk about this book. Um, we did a conversation before in, over Zoom around the book, I guess about a year ago. I can't remember but when the book first came out. And I also assigned it to my course on neoliberalism, which attracts 400 students. Uh, and so it was really great to teach it and amazing. Um, there are many lessons here, and one of the biggest ones is that in the 21st century, there is one working class. Um, the majority of that class is made up of racialized, um, although, as Ruthie says, a problematic term, migrant uh, women. And yesterday, of course, I see you, Ruthie, back there. Um, uh, in, in Ruthie's talk yesterday, she underscored the point that, you know, within the U.S., like half the workforce kind of falls under the category of excluded worker, which is kind of amazing. Now, scale that up and think about what it means to be a migrant worker when in, men, in most cases migrant workers are excluded workers. They're excluded in one context, moved to another context, um, and, de and denied a right to a decent livelihood. Um, so in many ways, when we think about the kind of massive excluded workforce that it takes to form this migrant labor regime, which we sometimes call refugee as if the condition is temporary and exceptional when, of course, we know it's not. Um, but what we're seeing and what, what uh, Harsha shows us is the consequences of gendered racial capitalism in the 21st century shaped by the climate catastrophe and colonial order of its own making. Um, but borders and border thinking makes it impossible for a lot of us to see that. That's the beauty of the book. You know, you begin to see this. Um, I'm gonna skip over a lot of stuff so that we can have a conversation and open up. Um, I had a lot written here. A um, Couple things, to understand this, we have to distinguish between neoliberal ideology that encourages labor migration in the interest of capital accumulation from xenophobia. And in fact, one of the brilliant um, insights uh, that Border and Rule makes is that, you know, Harsher thoroughly rejects the whole politics of fear argument, which he, it's a trap we fall into, meant to explain white working class racism and xenophobia as misdirected rage. And instead, she makes clear how borders facilitate the segmentation of the working class and the super exploitation of immigrant labor. Um, and she shows that modern neoliberals are not calling for open borders. Some might be, and, and in fact, there's a tradition of that, which as she was kind of hinting at, um, but it, they're calling for a managed system of insourcing as opposed to outsourcing. So we get the expansion of export processing zones, we get the corresponding expansion of insourcing through state-managed migrant labor regimes, um, and if it's packaged correctly, and I'm warning those of you who are working for the Democratic Party right now, I know some of you are here, um, <laughs> it, it could look like immigration reform, masking the brutal continuation of, of exploitation and violence, right? Um, and, you know, and also talking about, like, where is the border? Uh, we, you know, we're way past the idea of the border as simply a north-south divide. Um, this, these borders are in motion. Some of the largest importers of migrant labor are in countries like South Korea, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, other Gulf oil countries. Uh, uh, India, now the leading world neoliberal power, is also an exporter of migrant labor. Um, and then these sort of, uh, these labor migration programs are designed to do a number of things, to fill labor shortages, you know, decrease unemployment, allegedly. But when you look at it, and this is, the, again, this is in the book, Migrant labor programs are state-sanctioned programs of indentured work. 
legalized segregation and a carceral regime, it's all at the same time. Um, so just some concluding remarks here, I'm gonna skip over some of this. Um, to think about what it means to have a world without borders, where, bo where border abolition is central, um, is really, really, it should be at the heart of our conversation throughout this weekend. Uh, because border abolition, it's the only way to end forced displacement and immobility. In other words, um, it's not the only thing that's required, but it's necessary. Um, if you're gonna end war and military occupation, you can't have borders. If you're gonna end land grabs, export processing zones, resource extraction, you can't have borders. Uh, we cannot possibly abolish the police and prisons without abolishing borders because the basis for criminalizing probably half the world's population is borders, when we think about it. Um, and honestly, to truly respect indigenous sovereignty all over the globe requires the abolition of borders. And, and, and you know, the um, Red Nation's very clear, they're talking about imperial borders. Um, borders, the imperial borders that we know in terms of glo global history are not that, they haven't been around that long. <laughs> in some cases, this 20th century, right? Um, in any case, implied in all this, I think, and this is the last thing, and I'm gonna ask you some questions, um, is a call for an internationalist, anti-capitalist politics of no borders, which I would, which I read as also, and you said this at the very end of, of your talk, a struggle for decolonization and the creation of new commons. And I say new commons, not the restoration of old commons, but new commons, because new commons means also uh, acknowledging uh, you know, the rights of sovereign nations, right? So having said all that, um, I wanna, I have a few questions just for a conversation Then we're gonna open it up in seven minutes. Um, one is, has to do with the labor movement, something you said at the very end about the labor movement. I would love for you to, um, to amplify this. So we're living through this resurgent labor movement. Everyone's very excited about it. New York Times writing about it, the Washington Post. Um, and this is a movement that, when you think about it, and again, I go back to Ruthie's brilliant talk last night. I couldn't even sleep, it jacked me up, you know. <laughs> totally jacked me up last night. Thinking about this, you messed up my talk for tonight. Um, <laughs> but one of the, you know, you talked about uh, justice for janitors, which was one of the key labor struggles that was a struggle led largely by uh, migrant workers or second generation migrants, um, but you have Immokalee workers, you have a Unite Here. In other words, this resurgent labor movement is not just um, college grads working at Starbucks, you know? This is the excluded workers movement, for example, excluded workers Congress. So what do you, what do you demand of the labor movement, of this resurgent labor movement? What are you asking? Um, in terms of, of a, uh, a different border policy, you know, your, your thoughts. Robin Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, starting with the heavy questions, <laughs> no softballs. Um, or curveballs, I don't know. I don't know sports analogies. Dave's not in the room, right? Um, I, I think the, you know, I, I think one of the things that the, the new resurgent labor movement is proving, and I'll say proving because it's not new, is that the, is that the spear of class struggle is multiracial and always has been multiracial. Um, and that, you know, that's the reality of the working class, right? Um, I think one thing that is um, really exciting is that contrary to past labor movements, including the kind of radical edge of labor movements, you know, we can think to Chavez, for example, um, there, there is a recognition, um, I think increasingly, that border enforcement is not in the interest of any workers, that that is a divisive strategy 
that that goes against the interest of any organizing base's own interests, and it goes in against the interest of a working class movement um, globally, right, and internationally. So I think that is what is promising, is that not only is the movement multiracial and led by multiracial feminists in particular, you know, thinking of nurses, thinking of teachers and more, of domestic workers, of course, um, but also that there is a recognition that a working class movement has to be aligned with migrant justice movements, that these are not separate movements, that we can only build a labor movement that has a politics of understanding the border at its core, right? That these are not uh, an issue of alliance and solidarity, that this is the class struggle, that this is a labor union movement. Um, and I think also the fact that insourcing and outsourcing have become such a key method of neoliberalism means that it becomes even more obvious that we have to make the border obsolete, that we cannot allow the border to continue to divide workers, which is what capitalism intends, as of course it flows freely. So I think the demand is, you know, as I'd articulated, that you know, an injury to one is an injury to all, and that when we're fighting, um, that our demands are articulated in such a way that we are also negotiating um, which we see happen, right? Collective bargaining for the common good, as an example of that, that when we're engaging in collective bargaining struggles, we're thinking, of course, about uh, you know, wages and protections and benefits, but we're thinking about the greater common good, which includes immigration status for all, it includes fights against the cops, it includes fights for housing, fights against evictions, that that idea of bargaining for the common good and for a new global commons um, is, I think, what is so promising about the, the kind of resurgent labor movement. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so let me, uh, I got three minutes. I'm going to, uh, oh, no, no, this is good. Um, I had another question, and this is also kind of a tricky question, but something's been on my, my, my mind. And it has to do with, um, let's call it left-wing nationalism. You know, we all, we all know about right-wing nationalism. Um, left-wing nationalism is complicated. Um, but... And now I'm talking about left-wing nationalism in terms of, of nation states that, for which we invest a lot of hope. And I have yet to see, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, a, a left regime in the name of internationalism that actually said, we're abolishing borders. Now, I know that there are limitations to the fact that you, know, you, 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 know, you can't have socialism in one country. Don't call me Trotskyist. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. But what I'm saying is that you can have it, but there's always these limitations, right? Okay? Don't, you know. Um, and I have nothing against Trotsky, by the way. He's a brilliant historian. Um, but how, how do we understand a future? You know, we're, we're, we're here at the Socialism Conference. We've seen socialist regimes. Um, we, we know, again, that there are certain kind of structural limitations on just sa saying, we're going to go it alone. But at the same time, you know, we had so much hope in a place like South Africa, for example. And I'm not saying South Africa is not a socialist regime. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that, you know, it's one of the places where some of the most um, kind of vicious attacks and anyone who crosses the Limpopo River is experiencing, uh, you know, kind of, in some ways, state-sanctioned um, xenophobia. So how do we understand and what do we do in terms of building uh, something that could move us toward uh, this world that's, that's borderless from the left? Aye. <laughs> uh, perennial question. Um, Maybe I can be flippant and say I'm a Gemini, so I have two answers. <laughs> um, um, I think, and maybe I would point to Fanon here, and you know, Fanon, when he said, uh, I'm making sure I, I quote it precisely, national consciousness, which is not nationalism, is the only thing that will give us an international dimension. Um, and I think, I mean, I think really that's, that's, the, that's the answer, right, in the sense of, uh, an internationalism it, within which we can have a national consciousness, because of course, you know, there are so many liberation struggles which are rooted in what we understand to be a nationalist consciousness. 
Um, and I think there's a lot here that I think is also, for lack of a better word, psychic, right? And that we are so organized in a world that is the nation state currently that the only way in which we understand solidarity and struggle is mediated through nationalism. It is the only way in which we understand a sense of belonging or camaraderie when in fact we know that that has always been plurinational actually, right? That it is not, uh, when we're thinking about nationalism, it is thinking about it in a plurinationalistic way. We're thinking across and between and beyond gender and race and all of the kind of binaries which nationalism as mediated through the nation state wants us to believe nationalism is. Um, and so I think it's impossible to think about what, you know, it's this constant question, right, of like, are we anti-state or anti-nation state or anti-Western current state? Um, but it's impossible to think through that because even in the nation states that we're talking about, not only is there some of the most vicious bordering regimes, but we also continue to see such mass differentiation even among so-called citizens, right? Like, we haven't actually eliminated capitalism in any liberatory kind of context as much as different socialist or putatively socialist states have tried um, for all the reasons that you said. But I think that's why part of it is thinking about um, national consciousness and consciousness through a new commons or consciousness through solidarity um, that goes beyond the ways in which we have been conditioned to think about nationalism. Okay, brilliant. Um, question, I guess you can come up to the mic, is that right? So Questions for what we'll do is we'll take a progressive stack. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, excellent. Um, so we'll sort of uh, identify you by maybe an article of clothing and say you're next, followed by two other people. Your question is, you know, for the room, it's a discussion, not just a Q&A. So feel free to ask the speakers directly and then also address your comrades. Um, we're gonna keep it to three minutes per person. How many minutes per comment or question? <laughs> Just the three, all right? So, uh, who would like to begin? So we've got the comrade in the red here, followed by this person with an amazing afro, followed by this person by the <coughs> door. If you can get to this microphone with ease, please do. We wanna make sure the people who are listening to this live via the live stream can hear you. Um, and also, there are a lot of you sitting on the floor. There are also a bunch of open seats. If you would like to shuffle, feel free. All right, cool. Open seats next to these people waving to you. Um. All right. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, really touched, and I'm a little worried that they have, if they have enough books over there. Because <laughs> after that, I hope everybody's gonna get one. Uh, my name is Axel. I'm uh, active with a group called Speak Out Socialist in the Bay Area. Um, <coughs> Just a personal story, you know, I think I really related to what you were saying about borders and how they're racialized and genderized, you know, um, and classist. Um, you know, I grew up in the Netherlands and I've always had a dual nationality, so I've always came and visited my family in the, in, in the United States. And it's always been sort of like, a, you know, it was like, a, I just took it for granted, you know. Um, my stepmom and, and brother that I grew up with are from the Congo. And uh, they were forced from their homes, you know, in a civil war. My stepsister, you know, her hairline starts here because untold things happen to her. Um, she's the nicest person I know. And the Dutch government, for anybody who has any illusions about European social democracy, uh, you know, threw her in prison, mm -hmm. you know? She's like the nicest person you will ever meet. You know, very kind-hearted, very, you know, just a beautiful person, but they criminalized her and threw her in prison and you know, we were sheltering her you know, against the government. So anyway, um, yeah, I just wanna say it, this, this whole topic, it touches I think everybody because we all have uh, different relationships to the border but as you, as you so eloquently put, you know, you know, some people are, you know, capitalism is a very complicated system you know, and we all are uniquely affected. So anyway, um, we, we had uh, David Bacon speak for us in, in the Bay Area, and mm -hmm. I really liked his, uh, the way he put together, you know, this idea of the right to stay home, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think, you know, to me, and it, it's especially 
as you were saying, you know, for me, I'm active in my workplace. We use workplace newsletters to try to broaden out and, and deepen people's perspectives and understand what we're really up against. And, uh, you know, I, I really try to use whatever tools I can find, you know, and I think for those of you who haven't seen the movie Harvest of Empire, mm. it's like one of my key tools. And uh, yeah, if there's any mm. like resources like that, that, you know, your ideas are so like lucid and so important and for Robin Kelly too, um, you know, if there's any type of resources that are sort of like more digestible or usable with my coworkers, you know, that would be really, you know, if, if anything comes to mind. But thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. You want to share any resources that come to mind? Oh, did you, do you want us to do one, one by one or to do a stack? I think I can, there. We, yeah. can, we can wait, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> come on. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> and thank you so much for the talk. Really, really appreciated it. Um, so I, I work uh, for an organization called Austin Justice Coalition, out of, working out of Austin, Texas, do a lot of work um, fighting p uh, police and prison uh, expansion um, in, in our community. And when I have the uh, opportunity or occasion, particularly to speak to young people and people in college, I talk about the criminalization and immigration systems, particularly uh, recreating the conditions of slavery. And, and I, I, of course, talk a lot about what you talked about in terms of um, uh, uh, how you know, really it's this insourcing uh, and, and using uh, the, these systems to, to classify workers, to suppress wages, uh, both those that are criminalized and incarcerated, as well as those uh, put through the, the immigration regime here. The other side of that coin that I also talk about, and which <laughs> you might have just cut for time, but I also just wanted to ask the question is, is around the political side. Obviously, the other component is that it's designed to, to, uh, to keep people out of the political system. Uh, and these systems obviously very much target uh, people of color uh, as a means to, to maintain white rule mm -hmm. uh, in, in ways that are not dissimilar through current systems like prison gerrymandering or how the census uh, allocates resources uh, to areas that are largely rural, right? Um, and, but, but has now denied <laughs> that political opportunity and power uh, to the people that have been incarcerated or, uh, or classified as undocumented or illegal or what have you. Uh, but obviously that, that system, like the three fish rule, um, denied, uh, empowered the political enemies of, of enslaved people while um, disempowering the enslaved, um, obviously exists within a nationalist context. And so I'm wondering to the extent that uh, that dynamic is in play, that's important in, the, in, in, in how you address these topics uh, mm -hmm. Or if in a no borders world, uh, we're really talking about um, a different, entirely political framework such that that, that, that particular piece isn't, isn't as helpful as, as, I've, as I've been, been thinking it has been. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm short, so this is a little. Um, my name is Tatiana. Um, I'm with Left Voice. And um, first of all, thank you so much um, that was incredibly powerful, incredibly deep. Um, and I wanted to make a comment, but also ask how you, how y'all kind of see it. Cause I was thinking a lot about kind of the political consequences of these discussions about abolishing borders. And I was thinking a lot about it because I feel like, you know, obviously Trump put at the cent, like xenophobia at the center of his political program. And during, you know, the Trump administration, I remember like I'm in, I live in New York city there were like so many protests and people were out and people were talking about, you know, crying about kids in cages. And the truth is that kids are still in cages, right? And those cages, they were built <laughs> by Obama. Yeah. They were built by Bush. Uh, they were built by Biden. Um, and the truth is that the, you know, social movement leaders that are tied to the Democratic Party, they only mobilize under Repu the Republican administration. It's been incredible to see that there's not, nothing happening right now. Um, and I think that's really messed up. And I think that um, in that sense, it's super important for us to politically say, in this struggle to abolish borders, the Democrats and the Republicans are our enemies. Wow. And I think there was a real mistake during the whole Sanders movement, because Bernie Sanders said, open borders is a Koch brothers proposal, 
right? Open borders is a right-wing talking point, and no, it's not, right? Um, we want not only to open the borders, but to abolish borders. And it was a mistake for the left to make excuses for that. So I don't know, I think that it's essential for us to be internationalists, anti-imperialists, and to understand that that's a struggle for labor rights, that's part of black struggle, that's part of the struggle to abolish capitalism and the struggle for socialism. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to say is that I also think it's important for us to be clear, like what you mentioned, that you know, in other countries, like the leaders of other countries are being forced to impose border policies for the US. But also those leaders do that because they are also capitalists. And they want to maintain the system of private property and hyper-exploitation. And so that's why, for example, even though he talks a big talk, for example, AMLO in Mexico, like instituted a new border police in Mexico. And so I think it's super essential for us to be internationalists and to side with the working class and oppressed in other countries as well, even against like so-called progressive leaders. Um, yeah, that's it. Oh, and I, I am a Trotskyist. You what? what was the last bit? <laughs> I am a Trotskyist. I said I am a Trotskyist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna put those to you two, and in the meantime, if I can get some hands. All right, so this, well, this person here with the armband tattoo in the middle, and the, and the blow in their hair. This person here in the green shirt, that person all the way in the back with the headband. Um, I'm, I'm gonna leave these questions for Harsha, but I just wanna to respond to one, one thing uh, Tatiana pointed out, which um, to be, also remind us that um, uh, there are all kinds of kids in cages and some of them are not necessarily across the border. Um, and, and of course, she knows that. I'm not saying anything. But I just want to remind us that, and not just that, but you know, one of the, the beauty, beautiful things about uh, Dorothy Roberts' uh, new book is she points out you know, that child separation from families has been going on through Child Protective Services for a long, long time. And that's part of that fight you know, that, we, that I think, are, it's, and she's saying, I think we're all saying that they're all connected. Um, uh, but anyway, all those other questions, you, you can take those. <laughs> okay, I'll be brief because there's so many hands. I'm so excited to hear from folks. Um, in terms of resources uh, that are perhaps more accessible, I'm just going to throw out my email. Feel free to email me, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, there's tons of amazing resources for your shop floor, for if you're organizing in your workplace, in your schools, et cetera, that are, um, you know, think through some of these ideas in more of a popular education format. So I'm at hwalia8 at gmail.com. I'm happy to give it out later too. Um, and in terms of uh, the piece around, um, uh, the, the last piece, Tatiana, around the, um, the need to, to, art to articulate the Democrats and the Republicans as both our enemy, like hard agree. <laughs> it's, you know, it's bipartisan practice. Um, and it's so important, especially to be mobilized under and against the Democratic Party, right? Like not only against Trump, because that's precisely not, that's like being in a position of a, a weak social movement position is when we are demobilized uh, under the Democratic Party. And absolutely agree. My intention wasn't in, to suggest necessarily that it's always an imposed dynamic by the US or other Western countries, but really to say that immigration diplomacy is increasingly playing a role in geopolitics around the world. Um, and absolutely, we need to think about those relationships more expansively than just one of like North and South, right? Like imperialism is not just the US and the rest of the world. Sites of power are regionally differentiated in many different worlds, including especially, you know, Mexico and the relationship to Central American migrants, especially right now, uh, as you mentioned. Um, and so I think, um, you know, absolutely uh, agree with that. And there was a second question, which I now forgot. I should write these down because I was Response listening. Politics, political work. You talking about Tatiana's question? Or? No, prior to Tatiana's question. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, the political system. Right. The political systems. Um, yeah, um, 
I, I do think, in short, that in a no borders world, I don't think there will be a uniform political system that's you know impossible to manage on a, a planetary scale. That's part of what reimagining the world means, right? That there will be many answers, there will be many local contexts in which people self-determine what that governance means. We know it needs to be democratic, participatory, decarceral, decolonial, etc. Um, but I do think what is crucial is the point that you made absolutely that a key part of illegalization is to remove people from the political process. It is to deflate political and labor power, both because they work together. Um, and also, we see the pushback against that through transnational organizing, right? Like, that is also what is so crucial is we see so many people and so many workers that are organizing that we think of as just organizing in the domestic context are actually transnationally organizing. Farm workers, for example, are not just organizing in the United States, they're also organizing, you know, think of the MST, right? Are organizing transnationally. Same with national domestic worker federations that are now federating internationally. Uh, same with a number of migrant worker organizations in Europe that are also organizing in the context of fighting displacement in the Sahel region of Africa. Um, Migrante International, one of the largest Filipino organizations internationally organized in over 20 countries to fight against Filipino recruitment from the, from the Philippines, all the labor recruitment that's happening, as well as in 20 countries, including the Gulf countries around Asia, around North America, right? So these transnational political efforts, in as much as they are excluded from the political process, are also imagining a transnational formation of labor and political organizing that we didn't get a chance to talk about, but I think is so pivotal to understanding what a reinvigorated internationalist governance might look like. One other question, oh, okay. which is, um, so what resources might be available? Oh, email. That okay, was good, the okay, email. Good. Okay, good. Sure. H W A L I A eight at gmail dot com. Yes. Okay, so question. Um, so there's a person in the row right there, followed by a person in the green, followed by the person in the dark right there. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Joanne Manning. I'm one of the co directors of Gordon, which is an organization in Tucson, Arizona. We do popular education programming about borders and immigration and social action rooted in local organizing. Um, and I have a two-part question uh, for you all and also for the audience. Um, while we fight for necessary protections for our community through modes of citizenship and legal status for all, how do we fight for and create systems of rights that are not based on citizenship to a nation state, but rather on residents in a world where border regimes are abolished? Um, and how do you see the role of popular education in building the imagination, power, and movements we need for an internationalist, anti-capitalist politics of no borders and a struggle for decolonization and a struggle for new commons? Sorry, can you yeah. take the second one? Thank you. Yes. Um, how do you see the role of popular education? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bradley. I'm also with Speak Out Socialists. Um, uh, I guess, like, I've been thinking, I think a lot about borders because my dad's from Liberia, West Africa, um, and he came as, like, a refugee. Um, from there. But anyway, once I started learning about capitalism and socialism, I was so excited and it was like, socialism, we can't do it just in the United States. So I started talking to my cousin and stuff a lot more politically about things that were going on. And every time my dad, one time my dad came back from um, Liberia and said there was just like a lot of Chinese people there. And just like, then I started looking into like Chinese people in Africa and like the whole thing that's going on right now with that. And uh, yesterday, I went to one of the uh, sessions that talked about China, and they mentioned the, this thing called like the Huko mm -hmm. system and like the the internal borders and stuff like that that exists there. And I'm just like thinking about that. Um, how like what it what is it? How does the the framework that she set up apply to like the specific uh, 
circumstances that we see with China and how they deal with borders, both like internally and then also in their practices of like imperialism in like Africa and so on and so forth. Because a lot of times they also move large populations to uh, these places and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's my question. Hi, uh, my name is Azal Tarefi, and I'm first just immensely grateful to you both. Your work has been so, so formative for me. And my family migrated, my parents migrated here from Sudan, and uh, the majority of my family is still there as the revolution <coughs> enters its third year, in which its demands for abolition of the global capitalist order and for our liberation stand strong. And. Um, <laughs> And so this is resident in a really deep and personal way. And one of the dimensions I think just, and for me and for my family of the way that these border regimes are so violent is also um, through the ways that it reinforces and creates ableism. Um, the, these border regimes are carceral and they're violent. They produce disablement, they are disabling. And at the same time, they create these structures through which pathologization is used as a tool um, to immobilize people and workers, um, to categorize people as not being valuable and utterly disposable based on this perception of what their productivity may or may not be. And this is something that deeply affected my family. I am disabled and mad. My, both of my parents are disabled. And the extent to which our lives have been impacted by that um, is, I can, like, can, <laughs> can't describe briefly, but I think I would love to hear more about how those dimensions of ableism are so central to the ways that these border regimes are causing violence, producing violence, and immobilizing workers. Thank you. Thank you. Robin. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. Thank you for taking the mic, and I'm so encouraged. I hope, please keep coming. Um, it's it's so good to hear from folks. Um, in terms of the, the question about um, alternatives of citizenship beyond the state, even as we might be demanding citizenship from the state, uh, I think that really, that's the practice of struggle, right? The practice of struggle is thinking about how to be with each other, how to build forms of kinship and social relations. Um, and that, for me, is, you know, a lot of that happens at the local level, at the neighborhood level, at the municipal level, thinking about access to services, that people can access regardless of their immigration status, like all of that really redefines citizenship and, and an attempt to take it away from something that is regulated by the nation state and something that we actively make, right? Relations with one another, our responsibilities with one another, our solidarities with one another. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you know, two decades ago, Joaquin, who's a member of the Native Youth Movement, said something so simple but so profound, which is that we have to learn how to be human again. We have to learn how to be human again, and that is the redefinition of citizenship. Not something that the state grants as a series of rights, but how do we be human in relationship with responsibilities to each other, right? Um, and that is, there are so many other ways of rethinking, particularly indigenous conceptions of responsibilities that are not rights-based but at our kinship and responsibilities and stewardship based, right? Where uh, we have to show up. <laughs> Citizenship is a verb uh, in the same way that solidarity and struggle is a verb. Um, abs uh, and the role of popular education and struggle, yes. <laughs> I think popular education is so crucial to struggle. It's how we build our consciousness. It's how we think about our experiences, but also our experiences in relationship to other people in the world. Uh, and to make sense of the world. So popular education is, is so crucial in this, in this fight, in the struggle, and to think alongside and across movements and communities. Um, the question about the hoku system in China, thank you for that. Um, you know, and I, and I think part of what I was trying to articulate is that the border is not just at the border and that bordering regimes occur internally and externally in so many different ways. And the hoku system in China for folks who are unfamiliar, is basically a bordering system within China where migrants are moved and your place of residency determines your, your employment, your labor, your access to residency, et cetera. 
And it really is an internalized border, right? It's a kind of system where the border is not just, again, the nation state border, it's a bordering regime um, where labor and capital accumulation is determined through differentiation that the system creates. And so the border can exist anywhere. Um, and that is one example of that. And absolutely, I think, you know, a crucial question in understanding immigration is to be able to differentiate between the movement of people, uh, the humble movement of people, rather than the movement of capital and oppressive systems, right? When we think of gentrification, I start my book with this anecdote, um, and this I'll, I'll tell you how this relates to the movement, you know, the, the question about the movement of, of people um, for the purposes of imperialism. I start my book with an anecdote about gentrification as someone who's involved in anti-gentrification struggles. So I was on the radio, and I got baited by this caller who's like, but you believe in no one is illegal. Why are you against gentrifiers? And I thought about this for a really long time, for a really long time. And you know, I was like, the struggle against gentrification is the struggle against those who represent power. It is not against the movement of people who are looking to build home, you know, the humble people who are looking for a, a, a life in a low-income community, in a poor and racialized community that I was organizing in. And that is so crucial to differentiate, which is why talking about displacement and immobility is different than talking about movement. Because when we move for the purposes, of, not all movement is the same, right? When settler colonists moved for the purposes of settler colonialism and invasion, that is not the same as the movement of migrants and refugees who have no power in the system, who don't represent the dominant race, caste, class, or more. And so I think that's why when we just talk about movement loosely, we start to lose the dynamics of imperialism, of capitalism, that are influencing what kind of movement we are talking about, right? Not all movement is the same, not all people are moving. Um, so that was, I hope that answers that, right? We need to differentiate from just movement, from people just crossing, and that's true within and across state borders, which is why I use that example of gentrification. Um, and the question of ableism, thank you for that. It is so central. We know that capitalism and borders and all of these systems of, of um, extraction rely on a very particular idea of productivity and commodification that is inherently based in ableism. And we see that so starkly in the idea that, you know, even when we say things in the liberal response that, oh, well, immigrants are good for the economy, what does that mean for those who are not producing in the wage economy? And I say the wage economy because we know that everybody produces. We know that everybody contributes, but that is meant specifically as an ableist idea, as a criminalizing idea to exclude particular people. And so absolutely, borders which rely on capitalism are deeply embedded in an ableist idea of productivity and commodification within the wage economy that capitalism can extract. Okay, we have uh, 90 seconds. So in this 90 seconds, I'll say two things. On the, on the last question of ableism, absolutely. You know, I, was, I was thinking also about the way in which border, because you know, you, border is about violence. And this is exactly what the main point that Harsha makes about borders are vi about violence, uh, imperial borders. And so I think about, if you know anything about the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, they, they basically raise money to, to give children limbs who are being blown up constantly, especially in Gaza. So that's, talk about, you know, the disabling character of border violence. I mean, that's just one extreme example of what's happening all over the world. And finally, on the, I got 60 seconds, 50 seconds. <laughs> on this question of citizenship, I had a question for you for, and I didn't ask it, it was about this. And um, I just have to, I have to quote my daughter, Eliza Kelly, uh, who's this brilliant scholar at, at Yale right now uh, teaching. And so she was interviewed and she was asked about citizenship and she says, better ships than citizenship include friendship, <laughs> relationship, or even a pirate ship. <laughs> where, <laughs> where unauthorized motley formations are bound together to disrupt notions of the pr private, of property, of wealth and its concentration. I think one of the worst aspects of citizenship is that it needs authorization, or that its, its expression is tied to what is given by governing or ruling, or more precisely, ruling body. 
Um, the kind of citizenship I dream of is one in which we acknowledge our attachment to each other, desire to be attached to one another in relations other than property relations, right? Um, and by the way, that's a, that's a quote I use in, my, in the new edition of Freedom Dreams. Um, and that's, and Elizar taught me that, you know. So yes, you know, a border, to abolish borders is to abolish citizenship as we know it and create new ways of, of being and belonging. And if you want to know new ways, you could certainly read it in Ruthie's work. You could certainly read it in uh, Robin Ma Maynard and, and Leon Simpson's work in their book, which lays out a plan for that, how you live it. Uh, and, and a lot of people who've done this. And of course, you could read it in Harsha Walia's Border and Rule. Thank you. Thank you.